Hey, this is Jennifer Walden for Mixed Sessions Emmy Awards Season Event. I'm here with the team from Skywalker Sound, two-time Oscar-nominated and MPSE award-winning supervising sound editor, dialogue supervisor, Gwendolyn Whittle-Yates, MPSE award-winning sound designer, Steve Orlando, re-recording mixer, Danielle Dupree, and Emmy-winning supervising sound editor, Tim Fuscato. So, yeah, so the series, it starts out in this, like, black and white um old bewitched kind of show it's like really cheesy really goofy and then it transforms into this like full-blown superhero series so can you talk about that transformation from a sound standpoint uh like what are some of the sonic characteristics that you needed to establish in those first episodes before the show gets really like super powery steve and I talked a lot about this um, after we after we saw the first um, few episodes of the series, and um, we got really excited because I mean Steve has worked on so many Marvel movies, and um, I've I've been involved with a few, but it really seemed like an uh, opportunity to make it sound different, you know, than than we've had the opportunity to do in the past. Um, really, what I was taken aback by when I saw everything was how um, everybody involved in the project just nailed each era from the writing, definitely the performances, the costume design, the set design, everything was just spot on to the era, to the sitcom world. Um, so that really kind of put some pressure on us to make sure that what we were doing was really, really, really authentic to the time because um, Matt Shackman just did so much work to try and capture that. Um, so in order to do that, we obviously lo watched a lot of the sitcoms. Um, I grew up watching them, luckily, um, but it was I've never watched them from a sound perspective before. Um, and so our first kind of um, idea was to futz, was to, to futz the whole thing, you know, for the earlier episodes and make it sound like it's actually coming out of this TV of that era. Um, and so to do that and come up with like an accurate representation of what TV sounded like back then, um, we took, um, a, I, I, I copied some of the episodes, um, downloaded some from, from the internet and split out dialogue and music effects and um, kind of talked to Ren Kleist because he had just done Mank and they had done a similar thing for their Patina Pass. And um, so I, I ran dialogue music, music and effects through Spectral Analyzer, kind of saw where they were sitting frequency wise, and then kind of used different plugins and, and so on and so forth to kind of uh, emulate that. Um, and we got it to a point where we were pretty happy with it and we're, and, um, we're showing it to to Matt and his editors and, and they were into it, they were into the vibe, but it was such a big part of the experience of, of the story to be in the experience with the characters. Um, and we ultimately kind of felt like making it sound like they were coming through a TV would kind of be pushing the viewer away from this really kind of surreal moment of being in, in the television set with uh, Wanda and Vision. So then we shifted gears and we started, like you're saying, specifically thinking about what um, what sounds were in there. Um, Steve's sound design was already pretty far along and his like, he just nailed the taking Wanda's magic and putting it in like the bewitched, like kind of musical chimey um, realm. Um, so then we kind of switch gears to maybe using some like ambience matches to make a bed of kind of like noise for everything to sit in. So it kind of sounded a little bit older and, and aged um, without giving too much away to that era. And then from then, from there on, it was just about um, sound choices and like kind of making the really excruciating um, decision to not put anything in, <laughs> <laughs> which is really hard to do when you're used to just taking a track and just throwing stuff at it. Um, but, you know, listening to the old Dick Van Dyke and um, Bewitched, there's really nothing, you know, there's no, you, you kind of have that nice grainy, um, like film feel noise in the background, but, you know, you don't really have ambiences unless you're on an outside shot. There's no extra effects. There's barely any Foley, you know, so a big part of that was just kind of doing our research and laugh track. the laugh track. Yeah. Understanding what, um, 
how things were filmed back then and during that time, what microphones would pick up, what they wouldn't pick up. Um, and so it was a lot of trial and error. It was a lot of, you know, obviously they they were filmed on a set, but it wasn't um, a set that was terribly similar to the like big sound stages of that era. So a big part of that was trying to put their their dialogue and, and the little bit of, of Foley that we did have like in that space, you know, and also put taking the laugh track and just like Kim was saying, um, layering it in in a way that it made it feel like everybody was in the same room at the same time um, and everything was being kind of picked up by the one or two ambient microphones that they had. And also the laugh track changed through, the, the quality of the laugh track changed through the decades. So we had to make sure the laugh, there's actually a laugh track expert in LA who helped us make sure the laugh tracks follow the proper Dick Van Dyke laughing did not sound the same as uh, the witch laughing. Malcolm in the middle. Kind of thing. And Malcolm in the middle laughing. And then it sort of turned the laugh away and became musical stuff. So that was actually something I didn't know. So it was sort of interesting that that quality changed too. I think the other yeah, thing yeah. too was that the first episode was mono. And yeah. then we started to open it up as we progressed through the episodes until we got to, I think, about episode four, where we had the big changes. Once we were in color, it was always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. I, I forgot. I, <laughs> 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 I forgot. Yes, everything, uh, everything was in mono um, for the first couple episodes. The only times we would kind of spread into stereo um, was... Um, for the very subtle moments where they were suggesting that maybe something weird and funky was going on and, and maybe there was a world outside of the world that they were in, we would kind of use those moments to kind of spread out. But I don't think it was until maybe episode three, I think, that we really got to do a moment where we went from everything up the center, always stacked on top of each other to this like wonderful moment of spreading it out and, and being, um, being in color and um, being in the surrounds. and. So it was a lot of kind of like technical, boring stuff like that. That, <laughs> that well, I loved. I think I think Steve and Steve and I like really had an exciting time doing that. And, yeah. and Steve's design was just like so perfect. I can't I can't really praise it enough. The other thing we did that was requested by the director Matt was uh, as the <clears throat> as the eras changed, uh, as as we slowly slowly saw the hex. Uh, the quality of the hex changed to be a little more like, I don't know, hi-fi static. It was a little more complex as it went through the, the eras every time we saw a little bit more of the hex. So it was older static for older decades and tried to tried to just keep that sense that we're moving through the decades, even on the hex and the few scenes you saw in the first two episodes. Mm -hmm. So let's jump to episode nine, the final episode. I mean, gosh, the difference between like episode one and episode nine is like huge. Um, oh, yeah. So episode nine, you guys submitted for Emmy consideration. So let's talk about that one. Um, there's this great scene where Wanda's in the street and she's just experiencing this like barrage of comments from the, the townspeople that are surrounding her. Uh, she like freaks out and puts them all in like this magical chokehold. Um, and then, and then, um, everything just goes crazy from there. I mean, she like blows up. Uh, so can you guys break down this scene um, from like building the crowds and then hearing Wanda's heartbeat, you kind of get into her POV and her experience um, and then the sound of her power exploding outward? Yeah, that was a, that was a really fun scene um, to do. And kind of the, the big thing I remember about that was how much you had to kind of wrestle with with building and having this sense of, of um, being in a big crowd and tension rising, but also holding holding it back uh, because you really did need the big dynamic moment of her losing it and 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 her her using her magic, um, but also the constraints of um, the all the streaming loudness specs. You know, you can't start high and then end high and have that be something that actually translates um, to smaller TV sets. Um, so the uh, we definitely started with the crowds because it was pretty much all about their um, all about the people of the town in that moment um, and Wanda's relationship with them um, up to that point. Um, we did have some um, I think Steve did some design with um, Wanda magic and then also the spell um, Agatha's spell 
that goes around and, and kind of like wakes everybody up. So that was a really fun thing to kind of move through the crowd and kind of weave around like a snake and have that hit people and, and wake them up and have them all kind of turn and understand what was going on for the very first time. Um, but it was, it was definitely a dance because we wanted it to feel full and chaotic, but at no point did we want the attention to be anywhere but on Wanda. So that is, you know, it was a lot of kind of back and forth of crowd panic on her, crowd panic on her, and um, all the while having music kind of um, carrying carrying the whole thing. We did a lot of processing with um, um, with the kind of with the choking. Um, layering it on top of each other, um, running it through different um, kind of like um, vocal treatments, um, th um, like throat like compressors that um, emulate throats constricting and, and whatnot. And, you know, we wanted it to sound gruesome and, and terrifying, but also keep it Disney, you know, so it was a it was a fine dance for that. Um, but you guys, who was, was Kim? Did you record the crowd for that? Uh, we did a couple, we did a couple of different recordings for that because I think the first, you know, it's an evolving thing. So you kind of take your first swipe at it and then you kind of, uh, modify it as you go. And what it ended up being was that instead of having this like kind of gut reaction where originally, you know, we started really angry, they, their emotions got turned on really angry. And then we kind of pulled that back a little bit. And then even for the cho choking bit, we kind of went through a couple of different stages. Uh, like we kind of started too big originally. And so we had to pull that back. And, and what it ultimately ended up being was multiple layers and a lot of just more subtle choking sounds um, uh, that sort of kind of weaved together with all the other um, group that we had. And, you know, we did, this was, this episode kind of evolved over time. Um, and so there were various cuts of it. And so I think we did like three or four loop group passes, like through three or four loop group recordings. And finally we got the right elements in there. And that happened in a couple of places. Like it happened with uh, the witches as well, where things were still being uh, developed as we were still kind of moving forward with the loop group and the recordings. And so in our original recordings, it 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 kind of triggered the ultimate end of what we ended up doing, which was, you know, we were able to say, this is not what we want. So we can take that off the thing and we'll go to the next level. And so it ended up being a lot uh, s subtler than we had originally uh, recorded. But, um, you know, so there was a couple of different layers. There were the people choking and then there were just like, people that were heavily breathing and you just, you had to make this pad, but it couldn't be overly intrusive either. Yeah. So I think we even my... got, got the Skywalker uh, choir to do some choking and some. We did. We, did. we recruited some family members from yeah. work from home to come and scream and choke and cry and yeah. <laughs> have their moment of fame. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's like that with a lot of things, you know, the initial vision is one thing and it's like a sculpture, a sculptor, you know, it's like you're kind of pulling away things that, you know, aren't working until you get to the bits and pieces that you go, OK, that's that's fitting with the story. And and they're changing and we're trying to keep up with the changes that they're putting in front of us. Yeah, yeah well, that was a pretty challenging episode all over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think they were working on that episode the entire time we were working on all the other episodes, just from yeah. the tech standpoint alone. I know very, very, very early on, Steve and I did some stuff. I mean, while we were still working on an episode one and episode two, we were doing some stuff for the vision voices. I mean, so that thing, that, that episode evolved with the show. So yeah, yeah. it's a combination of all these these things that came together. So staying with like the vocal work kick, um, when when Wanda like does that huge blast of energy and she breaks the hex, um, everything starts like glitching out. And so Wanda's kids are there and, and Vision is there and they're kind of like pixelating and apart. Um, I love the vocal processing there. It was really cool. How did you guys create that? Uh, <laughs> I started with, uh, 
uh, I did a treatment on um, Vision when he was uh, first trying to uh, get out of the hex. And uh, I used a couple of different processors to break it up. Like I think one of them was the dehumanizer. And um, there's a couple of good presets in there. And I did some uh, different layering. I didn't honestly think that they were going to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I thought they'd hear it and they'd go, okay, that's a great start. Steve, do something really cool. <laughs> and then it never went away. And then we got to that last scene where they're breaking up. And I was like, okay, well, it's kind of the same thing. So I just added it. And I think there were a couple of different layers. There was the dehumanizer. I think I had two different presets on the dehumanizer. One, which was sort of a glitchy kind of thing. And then I had the regular voices and then, you know, Danielle mixed them beautifully, but again, it stayed in. So I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I get it. But it is also kind of balance. Like, you know, you really, you really need yeah. to have this idea of the, of both the kids and, and also vision in the earlier episode, you know, they're being torn apart. Uh, that is, that's, the yeah. part, you know, they're being torn apart and then pieced back together, but then also, you know, they're, their performances have to also remain intact. You know, you can't just completely chop them up to smithereens and, and be like, here you go. Yeah. But um, yeah, it, so. I think it like, you know, what, da what Danielle did, the mix that she did with them. And there were a couple places where I think she had to push things a little bit more, but it's as a dialogue editor, both Gwen got to experience this as well. We both got to do some processing, which we never really get to do oh, usually get it's to, like get to make something sound get, weird and strange and crappy yay, <laughs> yay. yeah so yeah i mean yeah they they sounded great um they sounded great when i when i got them on stage even so even if i had time to take a pass at it i didn't I, there was no there was nothing lacking you know there and gwen did um do you do white vision well, I, yeah, I did, she did it. White. I did it with with Steve. We did it together. Um, actually, they said they wanted it to be sort of based on Ultron, so I got Laura Hirschberg's presets for Ultron, and then we kind of did. A, we took those, we tweaked them, and did a couple different versions. And I gave them to Steve, and Steve put extra sauce on it. And we we called it mushroom sauce. And we sent this back to Matt Shackman, and we said, oh, "I'd like number four with sauce." And so, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So he picked the he picked number four. It's like I ordered from a Chinese menu. So yeah. yeah. But again, that was also really fun because uh you get to make people not sound hydrated and full and rich. You could yeah. sound like Ultron, sort of ish. Like Ultron family tree. Yeah. yeah. One of the really tough things to do is to make two very similar things sound different. So we have like Wanda's power and we have Agatha's power. What was some of the things that you guys did to sonically differentiate between them? Uh, that was that was the challenge from day one. It was um, two witches fighting and and um, and uh, Wanda is so established. Nia Hansen um, and um, company have done you know. 10 years of movies with her it's um it's all very well established and it's it's big and it's full frequency and it it it's changed through all the movies to match her growing powers and stuff and then her powers grow even more in this um episode and then now we have a new um witch uh that 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 uh, at first you know is just doing a few things by the by herself but then is obviously going to fight Wanda in the end so um, <clears throat> kind of talked with Matt, the director, about where her powers are coming from, and and uh, did an initial pass, and he was kind of like they should kind of come from the same place that Wanda's do, and that didn't really work. Um, and then we started, um, we latched onto the cicada thing that uh, was kind of established in her little lair <clears throat> um, the first time we go there, and uh, started building magic from. From the from basically like magic sounds from insects and and um, fire, really. Um, and uh, so once we got once we kind of found a palette of like kind of buzzy, insecty noises and and uh, and kind of fiery stuff, it was easy to just start building sounds and kind of stay away from the 
<clears throat> the um, stuff that Wanda has is a little more um, sparkly and that kind of thing. And then um, once they really start fighting, the absorption sound was clutch, and that ended up being a lot of um, a couple of passes to get like stuff that really sounded like it was pulling Wanda's powers away from her. And that was actually based on water sounds that were, I just literally, I, it was very literal, like the sound of sucking water up and then process <laughs> um, just to get it. Um, so it did sound like it was being absorbed, but it, yeah, two witches fighting with similar powers so it was uh, hard to get going. And, and then to feed, we, we had all that established and then had to throw all that at, at uh, Danielle and say, make, make this work. So there's two witches fighting. Uh, um, well, I think I, what was particularly challenging was we kind of got direction a like a little later that Agatha's uh, powers had to be moving and crawling. It was like, not only do they have to move, they, they need to move kind of at this like creepy crawl type movement. Um, and then also, again, the absorption that needs to be clear that she is actually sucking up. Um, and that was, the, I think that was really a, a, something that we worked on quite a bit. And where we, where we ended, the, the last thing that Steve gave me, I thought was just completely perfect. And I don't know how you can get something um, to, to be able to balance all of that, like similar things. One is doing one, the other is doing the other. The other. They're literally touching each other. <laughs> Yeah. Here's here's a difference. We're moving forward. Music's blasting. Witch is screaming. Everyone's dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you don't want to lose a thing. Yeah. The movement across the screen. I forgot about that. There was several yeah. times where her magic had to move, and you know, with with the ten witches firing things, and the, the movement across the screen for one particular magic sound. Um, it was a lot of design and mixing, basically, to make make it all. Um, work and really trying to stay out of the Wanda's frequencies areas, which is big, and, and give Agatha's a little bit narrower um, range um, and a lot more motion to sell that it's different. So thank you guys so much for joining me and talking about WandaVision. Best of luck this Emmy season. Um, great job on the show. Uh, I just, I can't say enough about how amazing it is to go from, you know, black and white mono to like what it ended up like the final season. I mean, it's just phew, such an evolution. So great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.